You're watching The Daily Decrypt, where we are long on currency competition. I'm your host, Amanda B. Johnson, and today's episode is brought to you by Exmo. What does gold 2.0 mean? Will humanity come to prefer one currency or many? Why do we even use currency? It's time to explore these questions and more with economist and crypto enthusiast Jeffrey Tucker. So yes, Jeffrey Tucker. Uh, well, I guess I'm on my sixth book now, which is which is just great, and uh, tens of thousands of articles by now, and I have 150 introductions to books. I work for the Foundation for Economic Education as a director of digital development. So I have a big team, and we're we're doing you know awesome you know digital things every day. Uh, founder of Liberty.me, which is going strong, affiliated with the Acton Institute, and you know many others. Uh, you know, an early advisor to Ethereum, so I'm, I'm pleased to brag about that. So those. Oh, are I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, and I must say, in the Bitcoin space, Amanda, let's just tell her. I was out there pretty early on with an explanation of why I think this currency uh, and this technology really matters, and it was interesting. You sent me my first Bitcoin, that's as right. some people who watch my show might know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And, and at that time, there were a lot of skeptics, a lot more than there are now. So in many ways, the ceiling sort of fell in. But I felt very confident about, about the future of uh, blockchain technology and, and Bitcoin. And I think, uh, you know, my, my opinions and many of our colleagues and yours, we've all been sort of vindicated by events. So there, I can see uh, why right off the bat, someone who like is a programmer, is a computer programmer, would be attracted to cryptocurrency. And same for mathematicians. Uh, and you are neither of those. Right. Why did you, why as an economist, were you pretty early on like, oh, hell yes, this cryptocurrency. Well, that is a fascinating uh, thing to, to talk about, Amanda, because I felt like from very early on, there was a disconnect between the programmers who understood the value and meaning and, and substantive uh, historical importance of code and the economists who just don't get it. I mean, they just don't understand this world and why it matters. And economists for so long have been tied to a paradigm in which money really has to be rooted in some kind of physical bartered commodity, you know? And this is economists from all schools, Austrians, Keynesians, whatever. They all tell basically the same story about money's history. And they always have this sort of perception that, that money is fundamentally rooted in, in a sort of a physical reality. And they couldn't even imagine how you could sort of, um, how would you say, like duplicate in, a, in, a, in an allegorical uh, sense, that same physical reality in a digital realm. So it was just beyond, beyond the realm of possibility for them. And, and you'd think that economists of all people would be imaginative about undiscovered truth, but it's not really true. I mean, economists are fundamentally intellectuals and intellectuals have a natural sort of, uh, you know, sort of inbred arrogance, you know, so that, that prevents them from uh, seeing the next new thing. Well, you know, I thought it was interesting and I had not considered it before and I'd be interested to get your feedback, but I saw a video last year that was by a, a Bitcoiner guy. I'm going to say Wences Cesaris, but I totally could be wrong and I'm going to try to look it up and put it in the description if I can find it. But he basically said that according to his research, maybe perhaps barter was like not so much of a thing historically and perhaps never was a thing because barter is so wildly inefficient that it's more likely that like pre-monetary societies used like the gift economy, like the, hey, I owe you this, you owe me that. We'll just like give each other stuff when we've got it. Is that even a well, thing? Well, that, that is, and there's a lot of controversy about this right now. But I think the important thing to remember is that the story that economists tell each other about the origin of money uh, basically is conjecture. It's, it's kind of, how would you say, um, well, it's a it's a conjectural history, uh, you know, and and has less to do with uh, true historical documentation. I mean, we can we can look back and see many occasion, many types of money, and and our our logical sense tells us that money is invented as a way of sort of facilitating exchange in a way that's more impressive than barter. But that's certainly right. I mean, that barter stage might might last you know ten minutes before people figure it out. You know, so. Um, but you know, the, the, but what's what's remarkable about about Bitcoin is that it never seemed to uh, go through those barter stages 
Uh, so that was very confusing for economists. I mean, it just it's just awkward to think that that an anonymous programmer would sit down and bang out a protocol that looks and feels like money and actually achieves monetary value without having gone through the requisite stages. Mm -hmm. So I've unpacked this uh, this history in a number of articles, and what I what I concluded is that Bitcoin's fundamental value as a marketable commodity. Well, first of all, there is no such thing as Bitcoin. It's basically a mathematical fiction. We know that, but um, but but its fundamental value in the market. First of all, it's un undeniable. It exists and has existed since since two thousand nine, really, essentially. Uh, but given that it exists, there has to be some reason for it, and. What I've concluded in my, in my writings on this is that uh, the value of Bitcoin traces to uh, its bl blockchain services. It's the capacity to bundle up, uh, you know, information units and in immutable uh, forms and port them weightlessly and almost endless, in, uh, uh, almost. Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, to port them anywhere, wait, weightlessly and instantly, um, in a way that's that's not contingent upon any kind of uh, geographical constraints, and and blockchain technology allows us to do that for the first time in the history of humanity, so that turns out to be pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, that was that was something actually that I picked up from reading your book bit by bit, right? Um, because you discussed. Um, to, to introduce anyone to this concept who hasn't heard of it, there's this concept in at least Au Austrian economics called the regression theorem that says if something came about as money, it must it had a use value before it was circulated as money. Right. And so, uh, you know, when salt was money, well, hell, its use value before money was it also it's delicious and people eat it anyway. And so, as you pointed out in your book, the the original use value before the monetary value came about was the payment network like in what other way can can you send a scarce provably scarce bit from one person to another right yeah that's right yeah. and you know what's what's great about this amanda is that um the blockchain services allow this kind of uh this kind of documented reporting of the actual history of transactions you know that's that will live forever so you can go back and look at all the blockchain transactions between january 2008 and no it's january 2000 yes 2009 i guess and yeah. october of 2009 and see every transaction taking place where uh, during a time in which bitcoin had no market value whatsoever and there were about a hundred trans transactions uh, per day so what you had was uh, you know probably several thousand, you know, high-level geeks around the world were hammering on the system saying, you know, here's an information unit. Did you get it? Yes, I got it. Here's an information unit back. Well, let's slice it in half. I'll slice it in half again. Well, how about I send a tiny fraction? How about if I send, you know, thousands? And, mm -hmm. and you know, banging on the payment network for about nine months. So that was a crucial period during which time there was no posted price uh, exchange, exchange ratio between Bitcoin and, and any other currency. So that's the crucial 10 months in which we we discerned the value of the services attached to, to, to Bitcoin. Now, the regression theorem still works. I mean, a lot of times we used to think of the regression theorem as being, as you said, identified with physical physical things like, you know, gold has an industrial use, salt, you know, tastes good and so on. Uh, beaver pelts, you can make an awesome hat, you know, that sort of thing. But if you think of use value as not just restricted to uh, commodity value or, or use value of physical things, but also encompassing the prospect of valuable services, then that concept of use value actually makes sense as a kind of a pre-monetary stage uh, through which Bitcoin had to uh, enter and, and finally emerge from. So it does, in fact, follow the story of money, money, money's origin. But you have to understand something about the the history. But you can doc that's a beautiful thing, Amanda. We can document this history is thoroughly documented. You know, mm -hmm. it is, it's documented not in newspapers, but in the blockchain itself. That's nice. My goodness. Yeah. Well, before I ask you what your advisory capacity is at Ethereum, that is brand news, brand new news to me. Um, I wanted to address one. I made a video yesterday, and I basically said that 
while gold, uh, aside from the value given to it for like industrial purposes, much of its value is as as a hedge that people use against against uh, mostly unstable currencies or currencies which look like they're going to be unstable and are just are shitty. Mm. Um, I basically at the end of the video I said, "Whoa, cryptocurrency is gold 2.0." Hence excellent prospects and someone in the comment section yes i always read the comment sections I, you, I, every hateful comment i am sent you can warm your little hearts i will read it <laughs> <laughs> and um someone was like i'm giving you thumbs down because you didn't tell us how cryptocurrency is like gold so and i thought who better to talk about that with than you jeffrey tucker because yeah. the reason i even started learning about cryptocurrency is because you were making a presentation at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas in the summer of 2013. And you messaged me and you said, hey, do you know a whole lot about cryptocurrency? Because Bitcoin in particular, because if you don't, you should. And you should get yourself educated and come present on my Bitcoin panel. That's right. And I was like, oh my God. I don't, I don't know. And so I started getting all of these educational materials and like went to like the Khan Academy and watched their Bitcoin series. And I read all these Bitcoin books and then I gave the presentation with you. And if you'll remember, my portion of the panel was comparing the monetary properties of gold with the monetary properties of Bitcoin. And so I talked about divisibility and, you know, I don't want to list them off or do you want me to? Cause I kind of no, want fine. you to I mean, list I, them off. Well, there are like, there are like five that they have in common, right? Divisibility, uh, fungibility, high value per, per unit, um, uh, immutability, a limited supply, which limited is limited supply. So yeah. You have to have to store. Yeah. Easy to store, transportable, uh, highly divisible, um like homogenous like every unit is recognizably yeah. the same uh, as every other unit fungibility right mm -hmm. yeah just like you said and so yes so for person who asked that question yesterday jeffrey tucker paid economist do you agree that those that those properties uh do gold and cryptocurrency have those properties well, in common well they do and and not only do they have do they have them in common but satoshi nakamoto actually used gold as the metaphor uh sort of the allegor allegorical relationship for the creation of bitcoin itself i mean there's a reason we refer to mining Right. The, these are really verification services that are, are compensated in exchange for C C CPU power, essentially, that you have to cough up, cough up yourself. But we call it mining because it feels like uh, like mining out of the, the gold, the uh, out of the history of, of gold. And and there is an analogy there, too, with with uh, Bitcoin mining and real mining, because in the early days, think about the early days of the gold rush. Right. People discovered their gold and then their heels. They went out there with pans and, and they were you know, able to just put a pan in a river and spin it around and, and discover gold. But then that quickly was depleted and they had to go to the mountains and then that was, they had, you know, that was depleted, they had to dig further in. So you have to dig further and further into the mountains to get, the, to get the gold. And so the higher the price of gold, the more worth it, it more it's worth it to expend the resources that are necessary to get more gold. And it's, it turns out to be exactly the same in Bitcoin mining, right? The early miners, you just, you know, turn on your laptop and uh, go to bed and wake up, you know, with 100 Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a nice, nice times. Nice times to be alive. That's very <laughs> much like finding gold in the river, you know, in, in 1820 or something like that. So, but as time has gone on, mining has got to become more difficult, more resource intensive, and therefore it's, it's had to fly around the world trying to find the lowest prices for electricity and a little more centralized. Nowadays, that's not worth it for any individual to, to bother mining. So in that sense, there's an exact analogy again, but that's not by accident because Satoshi was very aware of the history of, of the gold standard. Now, uh, Amanda, the crucial thing, because it, again, Bitcoin was not the first cryptocurrency. I mean, people have been trying to do this stuff for 20 years prior. The question was, how can you achieve scarcity? That was always the issue, because the digital world specializes in reproducibility. You know, I mean, if somebody sends me an email, I can forward it to five other people. You know, I can, I can you know, I 
take a picture, I can you know send it on Instagram. It can be seen by billions of people instantly. You can download it and forward it to another billion people and so on. Reproducibility is the key feature of, of the digital age. So if you're going to have a digital currency, how do you hack it in a way that helps it uh, reproduce the scarcity of the physical world? That was the, really the difficult challenge. There have been many cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is really the first one that use the, uh, the blockchain ledger idea uh, to scarcify in an artificial sense and, and uh, timestamp and really title uh, ownership units to particular uh, the features of the, of the blockchain, which we call Bitcoin, um, in a way that really establishes a kind of uh, an allegory between the digital and physical worlds. And that, that was the innovation. That's what it took 10 months to test before uh, Bitcoin obtained its first value. So it was the scarcity that was the crucial issue. That was the one that was the most difficult, and that was the, really the crucial innovation. Interesting to think that something that required so much crafting to achieve scarcity, um, you know, hopefully, and, and as many predict, will, will be the kind of thing that facilitates trade in a world that becomes ever ever closer to what could be called post-scarcity. That's right, ever more abundant prosperity. But this one thing about, about money uh, is that you have to have it. There has to be a limited supply. I mean, if, it's, if it is infinitely reproducible, then it's no better than uh, you know, the leaves that fall off the trees you know, in and, and the autumn. Uh, it, it's valuable fall to zero. And the, the irony is, and this is interesting to think of, the, uh, every national currency in the world, government currency, uh, lacks the property of scarcity. Uh, you know, they are all capable of being infinitely reproduced. It was very interesting. If you reintroduced the dollar today and said, hey, here's a dollar, uh, let's give it value, uh, nobody would ever accept it because they'd say, well, I mean, why couldn't you just produce trillions of these tomorrow if you wanted to? Surely it has no value. I mean, you know, so, so it's funny that Bitcoin has a property of money that actually national money does not have anymore. So in that sense, it's actually vastly better. There's two senses in, in which, the two senses in which Bitcoin actually improves on even gold, though, because gold is naturally scarce, so that's awesome. But Bitcoin uh, takes up no space. Uh, so it doesn't need, you don't need warehousing services like you do with, with banks. The other thing is that it, it has no weight. So its portability is vastly more impressive than you would ever get from gold. If you wanted to, if I wanted to send gold from here to Beijing, I would have to either send a promise to pay or put it on a slow boat. And it would take, you know, several weeks to get there, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, Bitcoin, if I wanted to send to Beijing, I just press a button and it's there a couple of seconds later. Yeah. Well, I've had a couple of people ask me what I think about uh, gold warehousing services lately, where crypto tokens uh, are assigned to, say, like a gram of gold or something. And people are like, oh, well, then, you know, we can send the crypto tokens back and forth among us. And and it really represents, you know, the scarcity of like real gold. And that makes like zero sense to me. Yeah, because... I know what you mean. Yeah, I agree that, uh, you know, I don't mind any of these ideas as entrepreneurial ideas, right? All the power to them, you know, go for it. Let's see what works. But sure. yeah, I think it does. I agree with you, actually. I think it reflects a sort of a failure to understand uh, the essence of Bitcoin's value. Uh, well, and what's more, they're trusting that these warehousers actually are keeping like a hundred percent reserve and that there's going to be no fractional anything and that there's going to and and so it puts you back in the trust model and it's like no the whole point of an open source blockchain is that you don't have to trust that anybody's telling you the truth anymore because the truth is out in the open not locked away in a vault that's right and have you been fascinated to see i'm sure you followed it just ever since the Mt. Gox blow up, you know, where people uh, were, were given promises and they had to trust that Mt. Mal Gox had uh, their Bitcoin for them and that they really owned them and that sort of thing. And that whole thing just blew up completely. That ever since then, all the Bitcoin services are really emphasize, uh, really emphasize 100% uh, reserves. You know, and people are really scrupulous about that. And I think that if any any major Bitcoin exchange actually started keeping fractional reserves, we'd know about it in about two minutes, and it would be the end. So that's, maybe, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know like what actually happened with Cryptsy, but I do. I do know that 
it seems like every time it's looked like an exchange is about to make an exit scam, there are plentiful warnings ahead of time. Like people will be online being like, XYZ exchange won't give me my money. They won't let me withdraw. They won't let me withdraw. And after several months of this, it's then that things happen. And so certainly, I mean, certainly um, people using cryptocurrency, uh, there, there's so much, there's so much self-policing going on. There's so much, there's so much regulatory effort. Oh, you know, it's like real true. market regulation where people are like, yo, don't use business A. And people are like, oh, maybe I won't use business well, A. And that's, for that. that's right. There's, you get huge geek cred, you know, if you ever discover any real problems out there, you know, and you can demonstrate it and prove it. I mean, I don't know if you follow the Bitcoin uh, Reddit uh, forum. So there are many of them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're awesome if you discover problems in the Bitcoin in the Bitcoin space. You know, I mean, everybody rewards you, and and that's great. You're right. It is a kind of a regulation. It's proof mm -hmm. that we don't we don't need a, a central bank. You know, it, the big problem with Amanda right now in, in the Bitcoin community is I think many of us expected a greater degree of consumer adoption uh, than we've seen. Uh, up to now, and I think partially, and I'm probably guilty of this, I was a little unrealistic about the network stickiness of prevailing national currencies. The question in my mind is how long is that going to persist? I mean, will it persist in the event of, an, of a big monetary crisis? I tend to doubt it. Anything, in, you know, even if it's uh, like 2008, much, you know, say nothing of actually worse, we're going to see a tremendous interest in the cryptocurrency. And I was intrigued the other day, I guess you saw that Trump is talking about, you know, his, you know, outrage of the day. But, no, I didn't see this, yeah, Jeffrey. No, but, Tell uh, me. Well, his, his outrage of the day was that he wanted to stop um, Mexican immigrants in the United States from sending money back uh, home, for, from earning money, you know, laying bricks or, you know, tiling your bathroom or whatever. You pay them in cash, and then they, uh, they use money exchange services to send the money back to Mexico. He wanted to make that illegal. In fact, that's how he said he would pay for the wall, is that he would just confiscate all this money. Um, well, I mean, first of all, that's just outright theft and outrageous and, and despicable. But uh, beyond that, you know, you can't do that. You know, with, with Bitcoin, he would have absolutely no hope of, of stopping that transaction. There's just no, no chance. Because if you, if you, if you pay in, in Bitcoin, I mean, you can send it, you send it across borders with no problems whatsoever. I mean, governments ultimately can only control their own concert currencies. They can't control the cryptocurrencies. I mean, once you own it and you're in that ecosphere, you can move the money anywhere. Our borders don't, don't matter. So things like that are going to help uh, consumer adoption of, of Bitcoin. Um, I'm talking too much, but one other thing that I find it really interesting is that I was one of the earliest people to discover that the source of Bitcoin's value was, in fact, it's a um, uh, payment network, the blockchain services themselves. And in the meantime, we've seen a lot of innovation that takes the bl blockchain technology and innovates around it. And Ethereum is a good example of that. I mean, it's, it's not a side chain. It's not a colored coin. It's, it's not just an alt coin existing on, on, a, on, a, on, on, a, on the on the on the Bitcoin blockchain or anything like that. It actually creates a separate uh, network of its own. And the currencies associated with that, uh, which are really sort of investor assets of a, of a blockchain application, have themselves been rising in value. And you've seen you know, the so-called ether go from zero to something like $10 in, in, a, in a very short period of time, something like three months. So it's interesting. It's something I never would have really expected. So it's exciting to be in this space and to be surprised at, at all the innovations that are going on out there. What is your advisory capacity at Ethereum? Um, well, I've, always, I've been there for years and I'm good friends with Vitalik and, um, and I've, you know, since I'm not so much of a technician, um, I've always been in the position of sort of a more theoretical advisor. You know, is this, is this, is this possible? Is it likely? Uh, can can the, uh, you, an asset associated with the Ethereum uh, blockchain, blockchain application actually, you know, began to embody a monetary value. These are the kinds of questions I've been in a position to, uh, to sort of explain. And, uh, you know, should Ethereum itself, you know, um, just be a, a kind of operating system 
of for smart contracting uh, applications? Or should it actually try to demonstrate uh, these things with, with applications itself? You know, these are the, these are the sorts of issues that have come up um, in the, over the years. And it's very interesting because like even two years ago, people were declaring the Ethereum project dead. And now of course it's just rocking it so hard. It's just beautiful. Very good. So I have uh, a question to ask you, a final question about sort of your prediction. There, I've gone back and forth in the past between wondering, okay, so is the nature of money and payment networks such that we humans will tend to prefer fewer over more? Basically, will we tend to want a like a one global currency? Or is or can the nature allow for like, oh, like I love many currencies. I own many currencies because they're like shoes to me. Like some are red and sparkly and yeah. some are chunky and yellow. And what do you think? Uh, like um, I talked, yeah. Well, what do you I, think? well, I think that's a really interesting. I'm glad you asked the question because economists have traditionally always said that there's a tendency to unite around one money. Uh, that, like every every economist has said this for forever that that competing currencies are essentially inefficient, and that we want one final currency uh, because that saves on transactions costs essentially, and uh, you know that your confidence is then you know everybody the whole world is is happy with a single currency. Hayek challenged that idea. Uh, in the 19, early 1970s with his book, Choice in Currency, actually. And he said that money is much more like toothpaste in the sense that, you know, yes, in some idealized world, that we'd have just one awesome toothpaste that the whole of humanity said, this is our great toothpaste, There's, we don't need another. But in fact, we never quite get to that end state. And in the meantime, we seriously need competition as a, as a constant check and a test and as a, as a template for innovation you know so you need the competition out there so that you can constantly have currencies learning from each other one currency innovates in some particular area and we're seeing this in the big bitcoin uh, ethereum space right i mean so the blockchain the the core developers of bitcoin were rather inflexible <clears throat> in adapting the protocol to accommodate the robustness that are necessary for smart smart uh, contracting so ethereum comes along with a very robusting uh, for a framework for, for scripting and that sort of thing that, that allows for the creation of, you know, much more robust and, and vast forms of uh, smart contracting. So you've got a, a, a competition going on there for, for in the innovation. So I, I think, Amanda, look, you know, Bitcoin challenges everything that every monetary economist in the world and banking economist has thought of, about their profession and the way things work. And they're just now starting to learn and catch up. You're starting to see the journals now, six years later, you know, starting to deal with the reality of cryptocurrency and what that implies about their theory, which is good. It's good. Uh, we never, our theory is never perfect. And, you know, the advice to economists that this, that this elicits, I think, is get your head out of the books and look out the window, see what's going on outside there because the market is more than likely smarter than you are. That's smarter a, than any of us. Yeah, and that is a humbling lesson. But, you know, that's the awesome thing about the market. It's just so intelligent and smarter than any intellectual. Yeah, and by the market, I mean it's just like humanity, right? Just like the aggregate of all of our preferences at any given moment is like the market it's crowdsourced, crowdsourced knowledge, you know, and that's smarter than any one individual. It moves faster, it's more creative, it's far more unpredictable, but for that reason, it's, it's much more beautiful. And uh, this is the problem with states, essentially, that they, they presume to know things they can't know. And intellectuals and states have a similar problems, you know, with, with, with arrogance and an unwillingness to deal with the uncertainty of the future and have confidence that if we allow freedom to flourish, it, we will discover, it will, freedom itself will discover things that we ourselves alone cannot discover or anticipate. And that's a, that's a hard place to come to as an intellectual, but I think it's the essential insight that F.A. Hyatt gave us, and I think Bitcoin proves is proof of concept, really. Whew. That's a good way to end. 
All right. Well, thanks for your time, Jeffrey. And, Amanda, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see you. And you know, yeah. it's, just, it's, it's just glorious. I mean, you and I both have learned so much by being in this space. We both entered into it in a very early point, and we were both in a sort of state of discovery. And it's been thrilling to me to see your knowledge grow and your sophistication uh, grow and to see how intensely you've thrown yourself into this into this realm and you've made such an immense contribution because your your podcast is enormously popular and highly educational so thank you for your to your dedication to it and your scrupulosity of of detail and your enthusiasm which is absolutely infectious well i learned from the best and before we sign off mind giving us a, a url where people can oh, find yeah. your work listen yeah i'm i've thrown myself into reviving uh, fee.org which is a 70 year old organization but i want to make it a cutting edge digital uh, space and go have a look at it see what we're doing and our traffic is rocking it so hard right now i want to get you back writing for it by the way um, and we're doing we're doing a good job and i'm really happy it's just proof that, you know 30 years ago everybody said oh fee is dead no more we're, we're, we're moving it so hard right now. Our uh, latest Alexa rank is uh, 25,000. We're the 25,000th most popular website on the planet Earth, which is saying something. So just go have a look. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, you have yourself a fine day, Jeff. Thanks so much, Amanda. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Exmo.com, a cryptocurrency and fiat trading platform in business since 2013. Exmo recently added a Dash Bitcoin trading pair as well as a Dash US dollar trading pair. And they're the only exchange currently compatible with Dash Instant X for four second confirmation times on both your deposits and withdrawals. You can learn more at exmo.com. And speaking of such things, brothers and sisters, I have some freshly dark send mixed Dash that I want to send back to you. So the first five comments that post their dash address in the comment section below are going to get a dollar's worth of dash. Just a fun give back from me to you. Have a good day. In 50 years, are people going to have five different coins in their wallet that are all purely for payments? I don't, I don't think so. I think that wouldn't make sense. But they may have, uh, you know, 20 different types of blockchain assets that all do different things.